So yesterday, yes, Dr. Uh, Mansoro was talking, but he was talking uh, uh, more about application for the risk and how risk is uh, reusing the architecture um, of the uh, architectural model to actually perform the risk analysis. And so I'm going to uh, elaborate a little bit more on that and talk about the um, overall, um, overall standards in the area they are connected to, to together and actually what they are giving the ecosystem for the, uh, to automate end-to-end -end solution for the risk analysis. So um, as we know, tradition, the, the today's risk, risk in, in, area, in age of cyber is uh, quite a different from traditional risk where you know today we have to look at the and, and evaluate uh, the uh, threats constantly evolving array of threats uh, against our operational uh, systems and our organizational operational systems and uh, the okay this goes um, in order to protect our information, our assets, critical assets, and our services. So we need to know that our system actually is trustworthy, that it will uh, uh, execute only uh, the behavioral uh, behavior that is expected, and that will prevent any malicious attacks, okay? And when we are talking about that, it's when we talk about malicious attacks and, uh, and the bad actors, we are not just uh, talking about, uh, uh, about uh, uh, the actors outside, bad actors or malicious actors outside of the, of the uh, organization, but we are talking about those actors inside of organization because the threats comes from the people that are malicious inside, that they are clueless, that they are careless, and so on. They are all threats to our organization. And, you know, failing to understand all those threats, of course, can uh, uh, cause the havoc inside of the gov government and inside of the organization. So we actually have to be able to trust our systems, okay? We have to be able to have high level of confidence that our system will actually execute only trustworthy behavior and prevent malicious attacks. How do we do that? Uh, I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, we are in collaboration with U.S. Air Force, with the authorization office. And uh, uh, what this, uh, the particular authorization officer, what he was saying is, when I asked him, you know, what keeps you awake uh, at night, he said that the level of confidence, uh, when I authorized these systems, level of confidence that I have is not there, that I supposed to have. It's just not there. I have to have, he's saying, each system takes me 2,000 hours, between, between 1,000 to 2,000 hours to certify it, and I have 300 systems per year to do that, okay? And we use a spreadsheet. So you tell me how can I actually do this uh, in, in, a, in a, you know, way that I can have a very high confidence when I authorize the system to operate that actually that system is going to behave properly. So, so we, you know, we like this type of conversation because the reason being is it's not just from the vendor perspective. I am there as a, somebody who is very highly involved in the standardization of, of uh, uh, um, in standards and standardization of the how we exchange information, how to do certain things so that uh, um, you know we can build the models, um, meta models, so that vendors can actually build the tools on top of it and we can automate the space. There is no way one uh, company or one vendor or one tool can address this particular space. It has to be collaboration between the tools and the different type of tools, not even from the same area or from the same domain. So how do we do it? The only way to do it is to actually put together the set of the um, standards as an ecosystem, integrate those standards. And after that, when we build the tools on those standards, these tools are seamlessly integrated and can automate the solution from the one end to another. 
So, um, yeah, you can see sometimes, like, I, I love this picture because it tells you everything. It tells you clueless, it tells you careless, and it tells you how these threats were not actually um, um, looked at it from the, all the angles. The other thing is that it's very important to understand is if, if all threats are not accounted, and uh, so there definitely is gonna be risk that stakeholders will unwillingly take. They don't know. There is a lots of uncertainty. So we have to remove that type of uncertainty. And we, need to, we needed to collaborate on that and figure out how to do it. So on the other hand, that's the, from the top, risk from the top. From the vulnerabilities, that's the other end. That's the bottom. So the one thing is the risk as a governance, but the other one is the vulnerability analysis as a bottom. When you have this type of systems, and these are not even uh, you know, big systems, and hunt for the vulnerabilities. How do you know where they are? How do you know how important they are? How do you know where do you actually put your resources and your efforts? You really don't. It's very easy to say, to find one vulnerability and say, yeah, my system is vulnerable. Vulner vulnerable. What if you didn't find any vulnerability? Can you say my system is secure? Can anybody say that? So how do we answer that question? That's the big deal. So that's that what was keeping him awake at night. How do I put my signature and say my system is secure enough to operate? So um, when we looked at that, what are the challenges basically here? There are two areas of challenges. One, big areas. One is on your right side. Okay, how system can be attacked is the size of the system, sheer size of the system. Think about aircraft, think about avionics, okay? Uh, the other thing, what is the impact of successful attack? And what are the vulnerabilities that will enable that type of uh, successful attack? There was another anecdote, not anecdote, actually, uh, real thing, that um, again with the, with the Air Force, FAA came, they are collaborating, right? And um, they said, okay, in this session, they will present the uh, risk analysis of the ACARS. ACAR is the aircraft communication and addressing system, which, and reporting system, sorry. And uh, uh, it's basically data link. And so, they looked at the, that, they modeled the ACARS, and uh, they looked at the uh, risk analysis of the ACARS. And FAA said, so US Air Force asked, how many people did you have? And they had around 10 people. They had a six months period of time. They took, and uh, uh, they had the people from MIT and from different research labs. And the question was from US Air Force, and how many attacks did you examine? They said 12. Six months, around 10 people, all PhDs, okay, around 12 attacks. So the US Air Force was saying, how about those other 1,100? So what 1,100? Well, when we do this automatically, we found them around 1,200 attacks, not 12 attacks. So what about those other 1,100? So um, that was the kind of eye-opener, right? Can't do it with spreadsheet, just won't cut it anymore. So, so the, the, the sheer of the amount of the data, actually, that needs to be examined and put in the context is huge, and that's the one uh, area, and of course, I forgot to mention, you need to do multi-stage attack analysis. It doesn't cut just direct attacks whatsoever. It has to be multi-staged. So the sheer, of this, uh, si sheer size of the data. On the other side, it's how do we 
uh, achieve objectivity because today it's very subjective. Risk analysis is very subjective. How do we achieve this systematic approach? Have a high confidence into the outcome and be cost efficient only through automation. So how do we achieve that automation? Only through the standards. So we looked at the, uh, here in OMG, looked at the exam existing risk management methodologies. We looked at the, somewhere around 22 of them. And you can see each country has its own, ISO has own. Uh, and uh, we looked at the, you know, number one, fr from the different angles. What we were looking in order to do the uh, standard, we said the risk analysis has to be discernible. So if you are saying that you have a risk, you need to be able to pinpoint exactly where that is, risk is, in order to mitigate it properly, right? So it has to be discernible has to be connected to the system. And when I'm talking about system, I'm including people, I'm including processes, procedures, not just technology, right? So that's the one thing. The other thing is it has to be systematic and comprehensive, and it has to give you that level of confidence and need to be achieved, that. What are the findings? Number one, there is no freaking way that it's interoperable, any of this. So how do you put the coalitions together, right? The other thing, there are very few approaches that deal with discernibility, at least somewhat, some level of discernibility. And uh, very few approaches systematic, that they are systematic. So you know that Congress, uh, US Congress actually mandated NIST RMF, Risk Management Framework. That was the discussion as well. Each agency and inside of that agency, everybody has its own idea what RMF is and how to implement it. So there is no consensus. There is no guidance on that. So that was interesting as well. So we looked at that and we said, okay, so there are three things there, three out of all this, that are kind of, you could take them out and say, we can work with these three and combine them, integrate them. And that was the NIST, because it talks about uh, operational architecture. Everything starts from operational architecture, goes down through the uh, tiers of the functionality of the system, very important. EBIOS, French one, a uh, very systematic one, and HTRA, Canadian one, discernible one. So those are three that we said we can work with those three, but they still lack one thing, and that's the assurance, Le that level of confidence that they get, give it to you. So we said we're going to do these three combined with system assurance. And that's how we're going to uh, put the model together and describe the steps that will, the, the risk assessment steps, are all, all of them are the same, but you have to execute them in the particular order because that's what is going to give you higher insurance, higher insurance, sorry, higher level of confidence in the outcome of the uh, result. So what we looked at the, as well, the way how we're going to approach this, so it has to take the engineering part. It has to have the assurance case. That's the assurance part, system assurance process that will give us assurance case and will have a prioritized risk. These three domains absolutely have to work together in order to have very systematic, compre comprehensive, uh, objective, and automated risk analysis, okay? So one of the key components in this is the component, is the reasoning about system and attacks. So we talked about NIST. NIST is giving us this RMF from the top 
from the um, uh, concepts of operations down to the um, level of code and so on. So the, the, the reasoning about system, it starts by building the attack tree from the operations perspective. Because everything that we bring from the vulnerabilities, it has to be uh, presented in the context, how does that impact your operations? Anything that doesn't impact your operations, you don't have to focus it at that time. So we start building the attack tree, and that attack tree from the top starts to be seamlessly extended down through the tiers of the functionality of the system and goes through the even code and network. So when you find the vulnerability, you have outlined full path of, for that vulnerability from your operations down to the network or code. So now you have a prioritized risk and you have prioritized vulnerabilities that needs to be mitigated. I know it's easier said than done, but it can be done. So in order to do this attack tree, actually, you have to have all these uh, domains working together. So you got to have your engineering domain, which we implemented uh, through the standards like UPDM, UAF, or SysML. And we heard a lot about that yesterday, right? Everything starts in, and uh, develops from the architecture. You got to have your architecture very well done of your system. The other part that is very important is the part of the assurance. So assurance is we have a here um, standard called SACAM, which is the Structured Assurance Case Meta Model. So you structure uh, your assurance case in a such a way where you have your claim argument and evidences as a formally structured uh, assurance case. A claim can be, for example, uh, my, uh, the system is uh, secure enough to operate, and through the um, structure of additional claims, uh, decomposed claims, you have your argument tree. How are you going to argue that your system is uh, secure enough to operate? And based on that tree, at the bottom of that tree, you have defined evidences. Okay? So now, evidences and counter evidences. Now, when you collect those evidences and counter evidences, and that collects from the system directly, that's propagated up the argumentational tree to the claim. And that's when you see which parts of that tree are not satisfactory and which parts are. So your confidence can be low if it is low confidence, low or high. If it is low com confidence, you can do two things. Either bring more evidence to support your uh, tree or extend your argumentational part to put to bring a more um, to bring things to bring more uh, to bring more claims or argumentational uh, uh, structure about uh, uh, to satisfy that particular claim. So uh, the other part is very important is uh, when it comes to the patterns of the vulnerabilities, either through the, we call it software fault patterns, or CWEs. Uh, both of them work together, actually. And uh, it's all about vulnerability uh, detection vocabulary that is machine readable and that tools together, that tools could find it. But again, we know that different tools find a different of vulnerabilities and different patterns, they are not looking for the same thing. So you need many tools together. So what you really need to do is deploy many tools, but you need to aggregate their findings into the one report that will be able to be useful 
to the architecture and to the risk and to the, as the evidence to uh, uh, assurance case. So for that, we have uh, two other uh, standards like uh, TOEF, which is tools, Tool uh, Output Integration Framework that it's uh, done on top of the knowledge discovery meta model, which is as well ISO standard 19506. So, and uh, all that is basically given to the risk model here that will crunch, take all that inside and crunch, uh, uh, look at the system, develop the attack tree and crunch the numbers and give you the risk, uh, risk assessment outcome. So one of the things that, uh, so the tool integration is only possible through something uh, like this, through the standards and through the ecosystem standards. So if we have a tools on uh, sitting on all of these, on top of these standards, what we have in the, in the middle is a common fact model where we have uh, data fusion and semantical uh, integration of all that data and uh, basically for the automated exchanges between producers and consumers. So the, one of the things is that Lockheed Martin actually looked at that ecosystem standard and said, okay, we'll spend our IRAD money to evaluate that. So they actually um, took uh, tools in each of this area, all of them, and put together and into the ecosystem and performed the uh, analysis. So what they actually found out that uh, um, security engineer lifecycle cost actually was reduced uh, at minimum 20% and in some cases 50%. And that's on top of it, on top of be, be, being more systematic, being more comprehensive, and having much higher level of confidence in the outcome. Okay, thank you very much, Anna.